far from an energy utopia, but the people of Denmark live within one of the most innovative energy systems in the world. Traffic lights, computers and mobile phones, heating in houses and offices, everything essential to the function of modern society comes supplied with the aim of optimum efficiency and rapid progress towards environmental sustainability. Going from a contribution of 0% in 1973, we have now a contribution of more than 30% of our electricity consumption now covered by renewable energy. You can make progress a win-win-win situation. You get better energy security, you get better environment, and you make new jobs and new export income. And you have less political dependence on unstable areas. In this video, we'll explore the Danish energy experience, from the rejection of nuclear onto the decentralization of production and the push for clean, renewable solutions to climate change. Many of the people that are a little skeptic about uh, what has happened in Denmark, the investments in energy efficiency and in renewable energy, should look at the figures uh, which demonstrate that the Danish economy is booming since 1980. The uh, GDP has grown with 60%. And in the same period, there has been virtually no increase in the energy consumption, only an increase in the order magnitude of 2%. And that, has, that demonstrates that it is possible to decouple uh, economic growth from growth in energy consumption. Ironically, it was economics and not environmental fears that provided the impetus for renewable energy in Denmark, which now accounts for 30% of national electricity supply. In the 1970s, the country relied almost exclusively on oil. Then drastic oil price rises hit the economy hard. A more secure energy policy was needed, urgently. This was energy supply. It was not an environmental concern, but now added to the political reasons, the economic reasons, the energy reasons, come climate change, come the rest of it, and then it's very big. And I felt when I was environment and energy minister in Denmark, energy was in fact my most important portfolio. It was sort of a, the lever for the rest of the environmental policy. That was where we could really make a difference. Wind energy, which is covering today something like 20% of our electricity consumption, which is a figure corresponding to the contribution from nuclear to UK electricity consumption. And the rest of the figure is then coming from biomass that is burning straw and waste, the two other main sources of the renewable contribution to electricity supply. Nuclear power was, of course, an option, but it was dismissed in the 1980s. There had been a strong anti-nuclear movement in Denmark, and we believe us happy that we didn't use the money for that, that we consider a technology of the past, but we went for the technologies of the future. Heat and power generation in Denmark still relies substantially on fossil fuels like natural gas and coal. But unlike the coal-burning dinosaurs of Britain, Denmark has optimised efficiency through a system called Combined Heat and Power, or CHP. Most of Britain's power stations burn fossil fuels. The heat is blown away in cooling towers or disappears into our rivers and seas or along transmission wires. By the time it reaches our homes, two-thirds of the energy has been thrown away. That's enough to provide most of the heating and hot water needs of the UK, to say nothing of pointless CO2 emissions. In Denmark, you have smaller and more efficient power stations near to where they're needed. This decentralised energy enables both the heat and the electricity to be used in the local district, more than doubling overall efficiency. 55% of the total electricity production is coming from combined heat and power. And uh, that gives a very uh, strong uh, contribution to the energy efficiency because the utilization of the fuel content 
in combined heat and power is at 85%. Renewables like biomass and wind are also major contributors to Danish energy supplies, with wind meeting a fifth of the country's electricity needs. We went from this being, you know, um, something that only idealists were concerned with and a few uh, crazy scientists to a situation as today where 20% of all our power supply comes from wind energy. Not only it's giving us more energy supply security in, in we're using indigenous forces, but it's also given us a strong position in the world energy market. Uh, Denmark today uh, is producing something like 40% of all the wind turbines and so forth in the world. And that has given us thousands of new jobs and billions of, of uh, pounds in export uh, income. On top of that, we have a huge research and development facility and we are building up factories all over the world. And I, I think that this is the biggest industrial accomplishment of Denmark in the post-World War II period. One of the major problems in some countries has been convincing communities that turbines are not a blight on the landscape. Here in Denmark, there are many incentives to encourage local ownership. Small groups of turbines, or even individual ones on properties, are a common sight. The advantages of uh, uh, small, smaller wind farms for the local communities if, is that if they own them themselves, they also get some of the benefits and they have made a fairly good personal economy from having a, a share in a wind farm. Wind turbines fly on the site of a decommissioned nuclear test facility at the Rizzo Energy Research Laboratories. Here it's recognised the long-term future of wind power lies offshore. I believe that offshore will play a significant part in the future. What we have seen is that the price of offshore wind power by now is higher than, than onshore. But due to that, we have a much higher production from the offshore wind turbines. It will, to a certain extent, uh, lower the price in the long term. So, so we need a little more development of offshore wind farms. But when five, ten years, we will see that the price will get closer to what we have on land by now, and perhaps it even will get cheaper. So Denmark achieves 20% of its energy from wind. But what happens when the wind doesn't blow? We need some power plants that can assist when the wind is not blowing. And especially if we have natural gas combined heat and power plants, they have the possibility of being very flexible. So they can swift on and off, and, and then we can have the production when we, we need it. Unfortunately, we don't have any hydropower in Denmark because of geographical conditions and therefore we benefit from the grid connection to Norway and Sweden. Both those two countries have very substantial contributions from hydropower. And if there's then a need for electricity because of lack of wind in Denmark, we can draw upon the reservoirs in those countries. At the Rizzo Labs, scientists are pushing back the boundaries of clean technologies. Here, fuel cell experiments test combustion-free electrochemical power. Developing renewable fuel for cars is also a major research project and could be the next big breakthrough. But traditional biofuels are already here on a big scale. Avador 2 in Copenhagen is a biomass plant fueled by essentially CO2 neutral straw, wood and plant waste. Three bales of straw can supply enough heat for a home for a year not bad for agricultural waste that may otherwise be burnt in the farmer's field. Currently, 6% of Denmark's total energy consumption is covered by biomass. Heating from biomass is being taken down to a very local level. At the Hortsodge Eco Village near Aarhus, a community of eco friendly houses has been built using sustainable materials and it's home to more than 200 people. We have here a combination of uh, solar heating, which is providing so much hot water so we can turn off the heating system during the summer. And the rest of the year, we have uh, wood chips from local forests, which we are using in a wood chip boiler to uh, provide the additional heating that we need. The experiences of communities like Hortsodge as they bid to create their own clean, sustainable energy will provide crucial lessons.
Indeed, across the board, there's much to be learned from Denmark's approach to a cleaner, efficient energy supply. First of all, we have very strict demands for insulation of houses. Secondly, we have a, a strong energy taxation and a lot of the money is being plowed back into industry and into research and development and so forth. So the combination of uh, regulation, uh, taxes and plowing funds back to, to people has proved very efficient indeed. What we need is long, loud and legal efforts. And that means that, legal means that it should be based on support from government regulation. Long means that you cannot have uh, go stop effects. You have to have long term incentives uh, for the populations. And loud mean that the incentives created should be clear and obvious for the private and uh, industrial investors. So, is Denmark on track to meet its goals? By 2050, we should have a totally renewable energy system in Denmark. And, and we have the chances of doing so. But we also need to have more emphasis on energy efficiency, particularly in uh, companies, which is set back uh, in the current policies. We also need to have other technologies developed. We have a huge potential away power, which is not really researched into. Uh, and uh, we have a number of other things, additional measures to make it happen.